Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. We're going to pick it up here in chapter 4 of the great book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses giving forth a repeat of the law in layman's terms so that everybody could understand it. And, and that's as he was. And that's why this book is so precious. You know, uh, this amplifies into, actually, though it is the law of prophecy as well, in many places. And if you want God's blessings, if you want Him in your life, if you want to walk with Him, you need to know these things. They're very important. So Moses um, preparing the children, they're up at the head of the, uh, the, the north end of um, the Dead Sea, and they have conquered the land on the east side of Jordan. They haven't crossed over yet. And that land was given to Gog, um, to, to Gad rather, and to Reuben, the older son, and, and to half-tribe Manasseh. Very fertile land. And Moses then begins to reiterate some of the things that have transpired as we pick it up in verse 34, how when they went up to Mount Sinai, how God spoke to them. They weren't real happy about that. They weren't happy cappers at all. It frightened them. So having said that, chapter 4, verse 34, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation, by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. You witnessed it. Pharaoh changed his mind. God even hardened it across the Red Sea. He comes in the very dry round ground that they crossed on, and God drowned them in the, in, in the very see itself. God takes care of his own. I don't know, have you, have you got him with you? It's real encouraging when you do. Next verse, 35. Unto thee it was shewed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Uh, not some stick, not some idol, not some thing, but your Father, and do you know something? He loves you. He wants your love in return. He does all these things for a purpose, that through this family, Christ would come and offer salvation to the entire world, whomsoever would. Verse 36, out of heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, out of heaven, he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee. And upon earth he showed thee his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. <clears throat> and God is that consuming fire, a fire that warms your heart with the touch of the Holy Spirit. But if it's evil, it can burn. And as a matter of fact, ultimately, it is the lake of fire, whereas you would read in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, hey, don't fear those that can kill your flesh body, but rather, you better fear Almighty God who can not only kill the flesh, but destroy your soul, cause it to perish. Poof! That's the consuming fire, 37. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt. 
You know, I, I'm sure Father was kind of disappointed when he spoke to them after he had brought them out of Egypt and had really performed those miracles and spoke to them and it frightened them so much. Well, he loved them. It was his children. And they shunned him. 38. To drive out nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art. To bring thee in to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. You would think they would have loved him for that. I mean, he took care of old Og, the last of the giants, the Raphim that were in that area, cleansed the land for them. You would think they would really love him because of that. Verse 39, Know therefore this day, you can rest assured, know this day, and consider it in thine heart, in your mind, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. You, you cannot find any other. Um, well, how, how can I think, how can I know he's real? They saw him. You know, do, do you doubt the very vision of that many people that saw the smoke and the fire and heard his voice, their ears tingled? They hit the deck. They were afraid instead of receiving the love that he had for them, that only Moses could withstand this when he climbed Sinai. 40, thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong the de thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. How long is forever? Exactly that, forever. And he would promise Emmanuel, God with us, that would pay that price on the cross, that would give you eternal life whereby it would make it forever. This has to do um, longevity with, the, with a commandment, which we'll cover in the next chapter, is to honor your mother and father. It's the first commandment that prolongs your life, okay? But I do want you to take note that there is a difference, therefore, keep therefore his statutes and his commandments and his law, three things. Don't ever run those all together or, or you will be deceived and lack understanding of our Father's Word. We'll cover them more in the next lecture. Uh, and, if we, and this lecture, if we get that far. Next verse, please, 41. Then Moses um, served three, severed rather, three cities on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising. Where's the sun rising? To the east. These are cities of refuge for, well, let's, let's let the word say it, 42, that the slayer might flee thither, which should kill his neighbor unawares, not intended, but unawares, and hated him not in times past, and that fleeing unto one of these cities he might live. In other words, if, if uh, you were cutting wood with a neighbor and the axe flew from the handle and killed him, struck him in the head and killed him, it was an accident. Therefore, God's law was that you would flee three cities away so that one of his relatives through sorrow and grief would not attempt to kill you. Okay. That's, that was God's law concerning uh, accidental an accidental death. 43, namely, uh, Bezer, this means uh, gold ore, okay, in the wilderness, in the plain country of the Reubenites, and Ramoth in Gilad of the Gadites, and Golan, be Golan Heights, uh, basically, in Bashan of the Manassites. Uh, and so it was that they had these three cities of refuge to setting up the law as they moved in. You will have the Ten Commandments in the next chapter given forth in only the way that uh, Moses could do it. Simple, 44. And this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel. Not, not the second law, but repeating the law. 
45, these are the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which Moses spake unto the children of Israel after they came forth out of Egypt. He laid the law down to them. They, they had it very plainly, knowing and understanding uh, the, the, what, would it, what it would take to please Almighty God. Do you know something? When he said forever, he meant exactly that, for it still pleases him today if you want his blessings. Otherwise, you're not going to have them. Verse 46, on this side, Jordan, they're on the east side, in the valley over against Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt uh, at Heshbon, bon, whom Moses and the children of Israel smote after they were come forth out of Egypt. Um, then 47, and they possessed his land and the land of Og. Here's that old giant the last of the Raphium, king of Bashan, two kings of the Amorites, which were on this side Jordan toward the sun rising, over toward the east. But, you know, if you're not careful, you would leave who it was out who it was that gave all these into their hand. It was our Father. It was God. They didn't do this alone. Verse 48. From Aror, that's the ruins over there, which is by the bank of the river Arnon, uh, roaring there, even unto Mount Sion, which is Ermon. Verse 49, all theirs. Okay, 49, and all the plain on this side Jordan, eastward, even to the sea of the plain, under the springs of Pishka. Pishka being on, uh, at, uh, at Nebo and Nebo being the place where Moses would die, okay, or, or would be taken by God. Uh, this being the place that God told him, as near as you're going to get to the other side of the promised land, meaning on to the west, with the, the remainder of the tribes, is from up on the highest peak of Nebo, take a look around, that's all you're going to get. Well, I think there was... Inasmuch as Moses appeared with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to think about that. Many, time what, many times what man says is not necessarily what God reports. I'll say that again. Many times what man teaches or says is not necessarily what God teaches. Who are you going to choose to listen to? I don't, would not think you would have any problem deciding the Word of God. These words, the name of this very book, El Hadarim, Barim, in the Hebrew tongue. These words. Whose words? God's Word. Chapter 5, verse 1. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes, one, and judgments, two, which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep them and do them. There's three things. To learn, to keep, and to do. A lot of people like to learn, and some people even like to keep. But doers, that's a different story. You don't find all that many doers. And the, the, um, the Lord, our God, made a covenant with us in Horeb. And any way you want to slice it, the covenant becomes a part of the law or is hand in hand with the law. And you have to recognize that. First of all, you have the law, you have the statutes, and you have the judgments. And you have to, you have to know the difference. Um, and... And so it is as he gives the commandments. I'm going to split this up for you. It probably won't come until the next lecture. How you tell the difference. Okay. Verse 3. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. And I will repeat, even alive with us to this day. This covenant and these words still remain, 
if you want his blessings. Verse 4, the Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I mean, you heard it. You don't have to wonder if God exists or not. You heard that voice. Verse 5, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount, saying, what were they saying, 6? This, what was God saying? What was that voice saying? You want to listen to the word of God, and here it comes. Verse 6, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. I mean, there, there they were sweating and working for Pharaoh as prisoners, and God freed them at the hand of Moses as well. Seven, here comes the first commandment. Okay, you can mark it. Number one, thou shalt have none other gods before me. And there you have the first of the ten. Don't ever, you know what? He's jealous. Don't ever, when he did all this for us. He created all these things for our benefit, for our pleasure, for our lives. And don't put anything before him, especially don't whittle something out of something he created and try to claim it's a God. He's jealous and he will, you'll find out a little bit about that fire if you should do something of that nature. And here comes the second commandment, verse eight. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Don't you make a, an idol out of some bird, some angel, or any tree or thing on earth, or any fish or, or urchin from under the sea. Don't, don't, don't. You stick with Almighty God. After all, He is your Father. The beauty of Moses is that he even goes a little further than others do in explaining so that the layperson has a better idea. Verse 9, as he continues with the second commandment, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Now here's where many people get confused because they will not read or pay attention to what they're reading. And they will say, well, it, it says it right there that if a father sins, that sin's gonna stay with the family to the third or the fourth generation. The children have to pay for the father's sins. That's not what it said at all. And that's the beauty of Moses' teachings. If you pay attention to what he said, he said, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I don't care if it was a thousand generations. If they hate God, the sin's going to fall on them. You cannot hate God and expect uh, blessings. You know, in, um, in Jeremiah chapter 31, you, you have a saying that if, you, if your church has taught you that a child pays for the sins of the father, you want to remember Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29, which states, in those, day they sh in those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity, for his own sins. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Not a child's and not someone else's. Okay. So you've got to pay attention to what God states. To the third and the fourth generation of them that hate him. 
And you know something? You know, all that even the second generation would had to have done was to love him. And instantly, presto, God takes them in his arms, forgives them if they're sincere, and they become again children of God, and their sins are washed away. So you want to you want to be careful when people lay things on you without really studying God's Word, looking at all the facts and analyzing it. And you've got, you know, always, if the facts aren't there, you had better say, whoa, ha. That means let's look further. Let's analyze. Don't ever go off on tangents and dream without facts. God would never do that to you. Verse 10, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God loves to show mercy and love. Who did he do that for? To those that keep his commandments? Do you? As best you can. Nobody's perfect. But if you want his blessings, well, I, I have trouble with it. Well, then talk to him. Ask him to show you how to do it. Ask him even for his help in following the commandments. Okay. A ask him to assist you in memory or whatever is necessary. He loves it. Thousands he takes under his wing and assists and helps if you ask him. Verse 11 brings you the third commandment. Let's read it. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, first of all, always analyze what you're saying. And as I just stated, look at facts. A lot of people think this, well, this is cussing. Yeah. Well, if, if you say, I, I'm going to pray that Satan be damned, that's a good prayer. Okay. Because that's what you should pray. Or, or wish for you don't you know that because he's he gives us trouble, but the word vain as it is utilized in this eleventh verse, which is to say, uh, the name of the Lord thy God in vain is shav, and it means destruction. Who who is destruction? It's one of it's the prime of Satan's very name, the destroyer. Okay, and and. Um, don't um, take God's name and try to let some destroyer slip in and deceive you. Um, cursing is certainly not a nice thing. It's not nice at all. But at the same time, don't especially be deceived by the destroyer or the one that destructs. Hey, do me a favor. Won't you do that? Check that word out for yourself in the Strong's Concordance, the word vain as it is utilized there. See what it means. And then you'll better understand the commandment, the third commandment. Fourth commandment. Keep the Sabbath, this is verse 12. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it. As the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Thirteen. Moses always goes into detail. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. 14. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy men servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, and thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And what, what is Sabbath? What does the word Sabbath mean? It means rest. <clears throat> Was the Sabbath made for the Lord? No, of course not. He doesn't tire. Okay. It was made for man. And, you know, you want to be careful in the law and the commandments, what Christ fulfilled and what Christ became. The highest of all Sabbaths is Passover. 
And you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover. Christ became our high Sabbath. Meaning this, <clears throat> you either are in Him or you have no rest. You will never find peace of mind without Him, especially in this crazy mixed up world. In Hebrews chapter 4, it makes it very clear that Christ became our Passover. And also Colossians chapter 2, don't worship a day, worship Christ. Don't rest in a day, rest in Christ every day of the week. Every day in the week with Him is you find that peace of mind and that happiness. And that is not to say that the day shouldn't be set aside. But you see, look at the facts. What happened when we changed from the old calendar over to the Gregorian calendar? <clears throat> we had seven days. That's seven, uh, no, I'm sorry, 11 days. 11 days that they, they didn't know what to do with. So guess what they did? 11 days, they threw them away. Now, what did that do? Well, that changed the whole calendar as far as seven-day keepers go. Okay. You don't have the seventh day any longer. That is a fact. Now, does that matter? Well, if Christ became our high Sabbath, Passover, and Passover falls on the 15th day of the first month, and the new year, if you're a Christ man, you always use a solar calendar, not the moon, which is Satan's calendar. And you, the 15th day after the spring equinox, you celebrate Passover. It changes days of the week. In that week, you will have two Sabbaths, the high Sabbath and the other Sabbath. Therefore, you keep both and how precious it is. So... Be that as it may, read Colossians chapter 2. Read it very carefully with those things in mind. Next verse, please. Verse 15. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty, through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. And you should and Christ becoming that. Love Him, honor Him. Always take Passover and always know that um, as one of God's elect, you're gonna work on the Sabbath anyway because you are a pl seed planter and a teacher of the Word of God. God, for in the time of our people, he extended the day whereby we would never be in the night to win a war. He's done the same for the Christian. We're children, as you would read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're children of the day, not the night, so you've got nothing to worry about. It's all one day within the Lord. <clears throat> How precious it is. Okay, well then, the fifth, the fifth, um, uh, commandment of the ten. And the first five are spiritual. The last five are civil. Don't forget that. First five, spiritual. Last five, civil. And here comes the fifth, verse 16. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. In other words, that's one of the first promises of giving you longevity. If your mother or father abuses you, naturally you're, you're going to um, not honor them for that, but honor them only for the fact that they brought, they delivered you into this earth age, whereby you have the freedom and the opportunity now to choose God or Satan, it's your choice. But if you honor them for that, then God promises you a longer, happier life in the land that he gives us, right here. 
the sixth commandment. The sixth commandment reads, Thou shalt not kill. Now, if, if we were to call that uh, Hebrew word kill up, or you with uh, strong concordances, it would be 7523, and it says you'll do no murder. That's what it means. You will not lie in wait to take someone's life. It has nothing to do with the defense of our nation. And, and so it is that you, you're not to commit. Christ himself, in the fifth chapter of Matthew, says, um, that he calls the word kill, in the Greek it's phonyons, which means criminal homicide, meaning a murder that you're in danger of burning in hell if you do that. But <clears throat> God does always, you know, I would do a lot of repenting because God is the judge. We're not to judge. Unfortunately, a lot of people do judge men, and you shouldn't. It's wrong. You want to always leave the judgment up to Almighty God, and so it is. So this, again, is one of the commandments that is very often mistranslated and you get a bunch of Bible thumpers that when they're executing some criminal that maybe murdered a 12 year old girl and raped her, we're going to execute him. They're down begging for his life when God demands that his life be taken and sent to him. Send him on up here. Others will see and these things will cease happening among you as we'll cover in this book of Deuteronomy before it's over with. <clears throat> Our Father, many might say, well, why does God allow this to happen? He doesn't. It's man that allows it to happen. And as it continues, thou shalt do no murder or you will pay the price. All right, hey, don't miss the next lecture. Getting better all the time. God bless. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are, back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. Again, we don't judge people. We have one judge, and oh man, he is fantastic in judgment. Uh, he doesn't make any mistakes. He can even read people's minds. He knows even what they're thinking. So leave judgment to him. Teach God's word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Let the chips fall wherever they may. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. It's always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request? We can do away with the number. We can do away with the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Right now, do you know He's got time for you? You know, He created you different than anyone else. Your fingerprints are different. Your DNA is different. You're unique. God wanted someone just like you, but He does want you to love Him because He loves you. You may not love what you're doing. So repent. Let Him know you love Him and ask His blessings. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Uh, Katrina from Georgia. 
Why did Jesus have to die for us to be saved? I know that must sound like a silly question for a man like you with so much knowledge, but I just don't understand so many things. Well, well, make a note of Hebrews chapter 2. And you, you have a lot of knowledge. You need to exercise it, okay? Christ makes it very clear through the, the gospel, through, through the Paul's writings, why he did that. He came to this earth in the flesh because he sent us to the earth in flesh, meaning he's not asking us to do something he did not do himself. And, and then, as it is written in the 14th verse of that second chapter, he died on the cross, he was crucified, whereby he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. That's why he did it, because he loves us. No one else was perfect. Now, and many will say, well, that was an awesome price. But you see, Emmanuel, God with us, is who Christ was. And do you know something? God created the very soul of Satan. He's God's child. What does it take to kill one of your own children? And God's got it to do. He's already sentenced him to death. And inasmuch as the offspring of Satan at that crucifixion would cry out over and over, Crucify him! Then he has no problem destroying Satan who brought it to pass. In other words, he called for the crucifixion of, of Almighty God himself then God doesn't have any trouble destroying him. He's, he's gone. He's a dead man walking. Though he's still got a little, he's going to play a little negative part yet. David from Maryland, how long did the rich man have to suffer? And was it one of time thing only? And how, do, how did that work? I'm not understanding it. Well, he's still in paradise and he'll be stuck there until the millennium. And, and suffer, the only thing he's suffering, though I, he's burning up with the fact that he's so disappointed in himself that he couldn't see the truth. Because he can look across the way and he can see the Lord. He can see Abraham. He can even see Lazarus. And here he sits over here with a bunch of failures. And he was a rich man. And he's got to live with that until the millennium. He cannot change. He cannot cross that gulf. I'm, I'm reading from Luke 16. Okay. But he's not suffering physically. It's mentally and spiritually. Robert from Ohio. If Satan has a body, why does he not use it after he is cast out of heaven? Well, boy, don't think he won't. He certainly will. Okay. John from Wisconsin. Is it possible the deadly wound could be caused by the Tea Party in America? Now, stop and look at the facts. Okay. Look at the facts. Is America the one world government? Of course not. You know, I can remember m many years people have tried to say America is Babylon and it really irritates me. I mean, the very nation that God chose to be the Christian superpower of superpowers, you would put that on it. The Tea Party is bringing some common sense back into America's government, not the one world system. The one world system, quite frankly, is going sour. If you really want something to look at for the one world system, you ought to look at Afghanistan. What happened there? It's been almost a month now, not quite. Six UN, United Nations employees were murdered because they will not, for the same thing happened in Iraq, they will not pay attention to their security. And they hire people that are their actual enemies as security, and they end up, so what did they do? This is interesting, six dead, but yesterday they moved 600 out of Afghanistan. Now that's your one world system, 
flying south. I mean, they're, they're heading for the hills. If you want a sign of the deadly wound, it's not the deadly wound. Do not misunderstand me. But if you want, don't look at the Christian nation for the deadly wound because it's not the one world system. Our government is our government, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it will always stay that way. Uh, Carolyn from Texas. The Bible says that the world was populated by Noah's three sons. Why do you think the Kenites were on the ark since the world was flooded? Please explain. What, God, what did God tell Moses to do? Genesis chapter 6, take two of every flesh aboard the ark. The, were the Kenites flesh? Of course they were. They were above the ark, upon the ark. Why? They have, they have a purpose. And they fulfilled that purpose right real well. You can read about them in Mark thir uh, Matthew chapter 13, the tares. Liz from Texas, where in the Bible is the unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin is located in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. It is for one of God's elect to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up before the Antichrist. You know, many questions are answered for the Christian in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. Where are we going to be during Satan's tribulation when the Antichrist is here? Mark 13, you're going to be delivered up before him, whereby the Holy Spirit can speak through you and broadcast the real truth to the whole world. You want to be patient, my friends. If you ever wondered what your destiny was, and you are one of God's elect, that is your destiny. Don't sell yourself out for some frivolous nonsense by not arguing with some uh, agent in the byways, as the Lord says. Agree with them. Say, ha, ha, and go on. You go for the head of the serpent. You grab a snake by the tail, if you don't know what you're doing, he's going to bite you, and you're going down. Just be patient. Make the enemy pay. Look at the facts and always stick with them. And that way, you know, it is a wonderful thing to serve the living God. But know what your destiny is and keep sharp. Janet from Minnesota, was the eighth day creation also made in God's image? No. What did God say? Now, now, I don't know, I do not understand why people get this confused. This And Janet, I'm not talking about you only. Many people do. It said, God said, let us, us is plural, let us make man in our plural image. God isn't everybody. God is only one. We only have one God, and for you to say there's more than that, that's blasphemy. So what does Elohim, well, let's go even to the Hebrew, it means God and his children. Okay. In other words, God said, let's make man in flesh to look exactly the way we do. And that's why Jesus would say in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay. Kenny from Oklahoma. My son wants to know, how do we get and use our money without worshiping the devil? <laughs> you border, okay? You're from Oklahoma. You know how we used to trade horses there. I grew up in Oklahoma, and um, I was um, a grandson of one of the greatest horse buyers there ever was in Oklahoma. Matter of fact, he was the agent for the Ross Brothers Horse and Mule Company out of Fort Worth, Texas. Um, so you barter, and you always, well, what, how do you barter? You always have a little precious something that somebody might want and have them pick you up a loaf of bread. Right? It's only for a short time, and the Lord will take care of us anyway. You always have a little stash laid back. Nick from California. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, did he appear to Jesus in a beautiful form, or did Jesus recognize him for what he was? Naturally, Jesus could recognize him a mile away. He could feel his spirit. And naturally, he was in beautiful form because God created him beautiful, but so did he create Christ beautiful. And, um, and so it is. Uh, uh, Ren, um, Andrea from Georgia. 
what does 666 mean? It means that Satan will appear. This is the man's number, meaning this is when he shows up. Well, what was being numbered at this time? The six seals, the six trumps, and the six vials. Uh, so what, when you see, and what, well, what happened in each one of those? Well, the sixth seal is simply that you know he's coming. The sixth trump sounds the action of when he gets here. And the sixth vial is Satan pouring out on his seat. I'm sorry, Satan's seat being poured out upon by Almighty God. So 666, that's when Satan appears. Christ appears at 777, the real one, not the fake. Okay. Uh, Leah from California, does God hate, for example, does God hate the sin but loves the sinner? Well, do you want to know really what the six and even seven things are that God hates? Um, God hated Esau, as you can read in Malachi chapter 1, or you can read in Romans chapter 9. God hated, um, um, God hated Esau. But in Proverbs chapter 6, 16, you will read the six things that God hates, and all of them together makes the seventh. Okay? God does hate. And, you know, if he writes a letter to someone and they won't read it, you know, the penalty for false teaching is awesome. You don't ever want to be found guilty of that. And a lot of people will teach God, there's no way God could hate. Well, he does. I mean, look what's happening in the world. And, and you think he, he loves it? Of course he doesn't. He hates it. And so you need to read those six things that he hates. Uh, and ministers should be real careful about what they teach because that's why judgment goes to the seed planters and ministers for false teaching. When you got the word where you can look at the facts, you better stick with them. Rick from Idaho, why doesn't God take away Satan's power? Us here on earth have no power. God and Satan have all the power, so why doesn't God take away the power? Rick, you are so very, very wrong. We, if, if you're a Christian, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you're a student of God's Word, God gave you power over all of your enemies. Matthew 10, verse 19 power over even Satan himself in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you ever use it? Apparently you don't because you don't realize you've got it. My, our Father would not leave us defenseless here in this earth. You know, um, we have a shepherd. A shepherd will always take care of his sheep. That's why he gave us that power in his name. Because when you use that name, that that is evil runs. They don't run, they race away from you when, when you know what you're doing. Mark from New York, thank you for your teaching and your discipline and your staff. Well, thank you, they're excellent people. Are the souls that are on the wrong side of the gulf in a refining fire or a tormenting fire? Thank you. Well, I, consider it a refining because they're not really in a fire. Being in the presence of God, they're feeling a little heat, all right. But, but it's, it's embarrassment. Have, have you ever been so embarrassed you could just feel your face burn? You know, that, that's, the, that's the heat they are feeling. It's disappointment in themselves. And God is always a teacher. As they sit there on the wrong side of that gulf, as, as Jesus taught in, in Luke 16, and they look across day after day, hour after hour, and see how happy those are across the way for having followed the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father Himself. That uh, I'm sure they, they hate themselves, just as the rich man did. And um, so, so it is. But then that's a time of teaching because when the millennium comes, Many of them didn't have a prayer of a chance here on earth, but they will in the millennium, and that's where we're going to take names and kick dragon for sure. 
Discipline, discipline, discipline. Benny from California. How was Paul able to write so extensively in prison? Uh, what did he write on? Well, Paul, um, in the first place, Paul did not write many of his letters. Paul, uh, Luke traveled with him as well as others, and they were the scribes for him. And, but Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. Paul's father was a Roman, okay, was a citizen of the Roman nation, let me put it that way. <clears throat> and um, that, that brought, until he was proven guilty, he had all, even in prison, he had rights, and he exercised those rights, and God took advantage of it too, because Paul wrote most of the New Testament. What a fantastic witness it is. And he was given whatever he needed. Luke and others that were pinning for him could see to it. Uh, Beverly from California, why do you say that we were not made in God's image, but that we were made in our own image? Beverly, because that's what the Word of God says. Okay. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. I, you know, that's the second time today, so I've got to go and let's go right to them, right to it, and let's read it. What did God say? And God said in verse 26, Let us make man in our image. That means me, you, 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 and you. After our likeness, our again, plural, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. This, this was in the Hebrew, you go to eth ha-adam, which was Christ, okay, when he was created, male and female, he created them. They were not in, this is why, when, when, um, when Jesus would say in John chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, let me tell you something. We don't all look like Jesus. Why? Well, we look like ourselves. Why? Because God created each of us in our own image. That's why. And, well, how is it and what will we look like in the eternity in the spiritual body? Their age means nothing, so it's a young adult is what the appearance is, always has. Every time you see an angel, it says there was a young adult there, okay? Cliff from Georgia. Where in the Bible does it say there were people on earth before Adam and Eve? Well, we just, we just read it, quite frankly. And you have to know the Hebrew a little bit. It is on that sixth day, he created Adam, and he made hunters and fishers out of some of them. He made all of the races. God is not ashamed of the races. He's very proud, and each one has its own dignity. And then he rested the seventh day, and on the eighth day, he created, listen to me, Adam, a different man. And through that man would come Christ. And that's when he made Eth ha Adam. That's why I changed the title back in verse 27 to Eth ha Adam, meaning Christ himself. Okay, in, talk, I'm talking manuscripts here. Makes it very plain. Uh, and many would say, well, how can you document that? Well, look around you today. How, how, where, do you think that for a moment... Uh, uh, DNA will not allow that all peoples, all races, came from two people. Okay. The DNA is different. We, God created each in their own image. And he's proud of all of them. He, the last verse of that first chapter says, He looked and it was good. He loves his people. So they were here before. And when you look around yourself today, you see all the races. That's good. Miriam from Washington, what does it mean to not bother the tares when the tares come at us and attack us? What, what do we do? Well, you don't bother them, but if they attack you, that's a different story. You have the right of, of, of self-defense. 
and don't ever fail to use it. Okay, whether you use it through the judicial system or through your own might. Okay, Jimmy from California, how can a demon be alive and dead? A, a demon, you know, you got to understand, not even Satan is dead, and. There are many people like Rephiim, they're called the dead, though they're still alive, because they're already sentenced to death. And, and so it is. That's why they are called in the manuscripts the dead. And it would be Rephiim or the fallen ones. And uh, Psalms 109 would be one of the cases where this is utilized. But they're very much alive now. But when the lake of fire comes, um, they'll, they'll be in it. And some of them go in it a long time before the, the millennium is over. Charlotte from Texas. Do you teach that there is no hell? No, I do not. There's a lake of fire burning, and I mean it, it destroys. And you can read it in the last two verses of the 20th chapter of the great book of Revelation. It's, um, I have a work, if you're confused, of God the consuming fire and hell fire. Uh, okay, I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Look at the facts. Stay with them. You can't go wrong that way. It really, I love you for it, but God loves you even more for the reading and studying the letter he sent to you. Do a good job. Won't you do that? Makes his day, and boy, will he make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.